Eight years later, as a columnist, I concluded he'd done a pretty good job as governor, a very good job as governor. Top bond rating. Iowa had a budget <laughs> every year for eight years. You have some wonderful foils in this bin. <laughs> um, and so I wrote a column, a very profound, thoughtful column, saying that he ought to break his pledge not to seek uh, a third term and run for a third term as governor. He went on the radio this morning, big statewide radio uh, program, and was asked, you know, Dave Yepsen's got a column up this morning saying you ought to, um, you ought to run for a third term. And he said very, very cleverly, if I'd listened to David Yepsen, I wouldn't even been governor in the first place. <laughs> Secretary Tom Vilsack, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about the fact that uh, about 24 hours ago, I was in Cuba. Uh, and I was uh, at the baseball game. Uh, sitting behind Derek Jeter, uh, watching the Tampa Bay Rays play the Cuban national team. And it occurred to me that here I am uh, at uh, Southern Illinois University uh, in a public policy institute named after one of the great statesmen uh, that the country has had, Paul Simon. And I have David Yepsen to thank for both of those circumstances. <laughs> uh, what David didn't tell you was about 30 years ago, almost about this time. Uh, my wife and I were uh, strong supporters of then Senator Biden in his first presidential effort. Uh, and Senator Biden uh, was making the decision to leave the presidential race, something that I became familiar with a number of years later. Uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, and as my wife and I came out of that event uh, where Senator Biden said the penalty for not getting involved is that people less qualified than you end up governing you. <laughs> I saw David Yepsen, and he was uh, a reporter for the Des Moines Register, somebody that uh, all of us read who were interested in politics every week, looking forward uh, at that time to his, can to his uh, column. Uh, that changed uh, subsequently. <laughs> uh, and David said, you know, you really ought to think about running for office. And frankly, that thought had not really occurred to me uh, until he said that. Uh, several months after that, a tragedy occurred in our small town where the mayor of our town was shot and killed during a council meeting, and his father asked if I would consider uh, running for mayor. And I remember Joe Biden's advice, and I remember David Yepsen's advice, and uh, that started me on, a, on an incredible journey uh, and brings me here tonight. And I can take this opportunity, David, and sincerely to thank you for uh, that encouragement. Because when you had uh, the great political writer of the Des Moines Register suggest to you to think about a career in politics uh, when you're a young guy, uh, it makes a difference. Uh, so David, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. You know, I was down in Cuba uh, because for 60 years we uh, were trying uh, ways in which we could convince the Cubans to change their way of life and their way of thinking about things, and obviously that didn't work particularly well, so we've decided a new tact here. And we've decided to reach out to the Cubans and decided to try to begin to build back a bridge that existed many, many years ago. And I believe that agriculture is in a unique position to create that bridge, to begin building that foundation for a stronger relationship between the Cuban people and the American people. And I'm proud of the role that agriculture played yesterday uh, in moving that agenda forward. We entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Cuban Agricultural Ministry because we do have shared and common interests. Uh, the interest of uh, combating pests and diseases. Uh, they are currently dealing with an issue involving their citrus crop and so are we. The threat that we all face in terms of a changing climate and changing weather patterns that will impact and affect what we grow and where we grow and how much we grow. And certainly in a Caribbean nation, they are very much concerned about that. And I think both of us understand and appreciate the role that trade can play in developing relationships and creating opportunities for our producers and for their producers and for our consumers and their consumers. 
Cuba imports about 80 percent of all the food that they consume. And in the past, the United States controlled about 50 percent of that market. Today, unfortunately, because we've created barriers and structures that make it hard, we only uh, do about 15 percent of their trade business, their import business. And so as I started thinking about all of that, I started thinking about the, one of the challenges that we face in agriculture today. And we mentioned it earlier today when I met with a group of students. Uh, they, they were asking, in essence, how do we make the case to young people uh, to be involved and engaged in agriculture and agribusiness? What do we say uh, that would create a sense and a perception that this is something to be excited about? And I, and I thought about all the farmers that I have talked to over the course of this job uh, and as governor, uh, as a state senator, and even as a mayor and a small town lawyer who did a lot of tax returns for farmers. You know the situation where they would walk in with a grocery sack full of slips of paper and calendars with numbers on it. <laughs> they dump it on your desk, tell you to figure out their taxes, make sure they didn't have to pay a doggone dime more than they needed to. <laughs> and make sure you charge no more than 25 bucks for all that. <laughs> I listen to farmers, and I understand and appreciate that it is challenging and difficult. I know particularly now in many parts of the country with commodity prices not being as strong as they have been in the past, and the recent past, it can be difficult. But what I do hear from farmers often is the fact that it's hard work, they believe themselves over-regulated, and they believe themselves overtaxed. That's a very difficult message to sell to bright young people. So I'm here today to convey and to suggest a different message, a different frame for how we might be able to convince people to begin to think creatively and innovatively and passionately about agriculture. So I want to take you on a journey, what agriculture has meant to this country and means to this country today. And I hope by the end of it, you think a little bit differently about the significant role that agriculture plays in all of our lives. Let me start with national security. You may not think of agriculture in the terms of national security, but I do. And the reason I do is because we are a food secure nation. I believe we may be one of the only nations in the world whose farmers are capable of producing virtually everything we need to survive. We can grow it all, we can raise it all here. We don't really have to import anything from anywhere in order to feed our people. The reason we import is because we like to have choice and diversity throughout the year. We're one of the few nations and perhaps the only nation that can say that. Now China, on the other hand, has to import a lot of their food. Just consider the fact that in America today, even with the most liberal definition of farmer, which is anyone who sells more than $1,000 worth of product, that's 2.3 million people by our recent census, less than 1% of our population. If you look at 85% of what we grow and raise, that which we would need to survive as a nation, it's about 250 to 300,000 people, one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population, feeding over 300 million. China has somewhere between 60 and 100 million farmers, and they cannot feed their population. They have to import. And they feel weakened by that. They feel vulnerable as a result of that. They don't like the notion that they have to depend on the United States of America for soybeans. They are not a food secure nation. And we are. And so agriculture is at the center of the security of this country. It puts us in a position of great strength and power versus all of the other powerful countries in the world today. Agriculture also allows us to create relationships and to show the compassionate side of America. I was in Jordan not uh, too long ago, visiting with the King of Jordan, about the Syrian refugee crisis. And what the King needed was help from America. He needed food. He needed wheat for his own people. And he needed us to create opportunities to recreate and redevelop an agricultural economy in Syria. Because he understood and appreciated that if his people were fed, they would be secure and safe and happy. He also recognized that if he could create an agricultural economy in Syria, 
they wouldn't have the necessity of coming across the border stressing his infrastructure. And so he looked to America. He looked to American agriculture, first and foremost, to address the Syrian refugee crisis, to show the compassionate side of our country. So we were able to provide wheat for the Jordanians. We were able to give them uh, flexibility in how they would use that wheat to create economic opportunity in Jordan. And we made a commitment to work in the refugee camps to create a sense and a beginning of an agricultural economy. So it's central to our national security. We don't talk about that, we should. It's also extraordinarily uh, central to our economic security. Consider the fact that Americans, when they go to the grocery store, they buy their groceries and walk out of the grocery store, they spend, on average, about 10% of their paycheck. Globally, you have developed countries where you will spend anywhere from 20 to 30% of paychecks, and developing countries, it can be as high as 50 to 60%. Now, I ask you to think about that for just a second. Calculate what you make, what your paycheck is. Take 10% of it, set it aside for food. Then ask yourself what you do with the next 10% of your paycheck. What are you able to do in America that no one else in the world can do because you're spending less as a percentage of your pay on food? Are you able to have a nicer car? Can you put money aside for retirement? Are you able to set aside money, if you happen to have children, for a college fund? If you're a student, uh, are you able to live in a nicer apartment, afford nicer clothes, take a vacation during spring break? What do you do with that additional 10% or 15% or 20% or 30% that you have in America because of American agriculture? The reality is that American agriculture supports one in every 12 jobs in this, in this economy. It's an extraordinary uh, aspect of our economy that's underappreciated and underutilized. Peru just recently did a study about the opportunities that exist specifically in agriculture. And what they found is over the next three to five years, there are going to be 60,000 jobs available for college graduates in a variety of aspects involving agriculture and agribusiness but we're only training about 30,000 folks for those jobs. So even in this immediate time, if you're a college senior or junior or sophomore, there are tremendous opportunities in agriculture to contribute directly to the economy, while the rest of us have extraordinary flexibility in our paychecks to go out and basically support the consumer economy that has made America the strongest, most powerful nation in the world. It starts with agriculture. If you take that 10 to 20% away and put it to food, you can't have that consumer economy. You don't have that kind of robust growth that the rest of the world envies. So whether it's national security or economic security, agriculture is at the center. We have a tremendous opportunity to enhance that by continuing to do trade with the rest of the world. Now we're about to engage in the course of the next six to seven months, probably in a conversation about trade in this country as part of the presidential election, as part of uh, Senate elections, congressional elections. And I, I just simply want to point out uh, the opportunity that trade creates for American agriculture. Consider the fact that only 5% of consumers in the world today live in the United States. So if you're a business person, doesn't it just make sense that you want to do business with the other 95% of consumers out there? We have a tremendous opportunity with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Twelve nations came together in a multilateral trade agreement that represents 47% of the entire global economy. 47% of our trading in the US. An opportunity for us to have a stake in the ground in one of the fastest growing and most significant parts of the world today, Asia. Asia is home to 525, 530 million middle class consumers. In the next 15 years, that number will grow by 2.7 billion people which means that in Asia there will be over 3 billion middle class consumers. People that want American product. People that want high value, quality, safe food. Protein that U.S. can produce. That's 10 times the American population. Why wouldn't we want to take advantage of that opportunity? Why wouldn't we want to be able to have a high standards agreement that brings the rest of the world up in terms of labor and environment? 
This is an agreement where we've even convinced a communist country like Vietnam to consider the opportunity for workers to collectively organize and bargain. That's a huge opportunity for us to send a message about the importance of high standards in terms of workers and in terms of the environment. It's an opportunity for us to also uh, ensure that there's a balanced approach in Asia, that we don't cede the entire rulemaking opportunities in trade and every other aspect of life to the Chinese in Asia. So this is an important trade agreement that will enhance and improve farmer income as well as Americans' income. The Peterson Institute estimates that $131 billion of additional income will come from, to, our, uh, to Americans as a result of this trade agreement. That's $131 billion, most of which will be in the form of higher wages uh, and opportunities for farmers. The Farm Bureau estimates that this is going to increase ag exports by $5 billion, which, by the way, will support thousands of jobs. So trade is extraordinarily important and allows us to build relationships in all parts of the world. You know, as we begin to transition in a world that has for many, many, many years been focused on the military might of nations, now to recognize that the economic might is equally important. Trade will allow us to continue having ag as a central component to national security and economic security. Ag is also the driver behind the new innovative American economy. There's a lot of conversation and discussion about technology and iPhones and uh, IT, and obviously that's incredibly important. But agriculture is leading the effort as we transition from an economy that has been predominantly based on fossil fuels to an economy that has a balance between fossil fuels and plant-based economy. We all know about Biofuel. We all know that 10% of our transportation fuel today is being met uh, by biofuels that are produced here in the state of Illinois and my home state of Iowa. But what you may not know is that the Defense Department sees this as a critical component of its future strategy in protecting all of us. It wasn't uh, more than several weeks ago that I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on the USS Livingston. It's a destroyer. I was watching a refueling exercise between that ship and uh, the refueling ship where the fuel was bio-based, produced from Midwestern beef tallow. That's right, beef tallow going into a destroyer that basically is protecting our Pacific coast. It's a brave new world because the Navy wants half of all of the fuel and energy it uses in ships and planes and in bases to be bio based, to be renewable. It's an extraordinary new opportunity to redefine the Defense Department. And why? Because they have a choice now between bio-based fuels produced in the United States or oil that has to travel through the Strait of Hormuz. If you're not sure where that is, I encourage you to take a look at an atlas. <laughs> Ask yourself how safe you feel that the oil supply for, for ships and jets that are protecting you comes through that strait. Ask yourself, wouldn't you feel a little more comfortable if it came from Illinois or Iowa? I suspect you'll find that I'm right about this. But it's not just the Navy. It's also the commercial aviation industry, an industry that Illinois knows a lot about. You've got one of the major airports in the world here in the state of Illinois. In fact, there are 40 airports in the United States of America that sell 90% of all the jet fuel that's consumed. It's a 17 to 19 billion gallon industry. Agriculture is now being asked to step up in our farm uh, to fly effort to encourage the commercial aviation industry to use more biofuels so that they can meet the emission standards that are now being set internationally as we deal with climate change. This is an enormous new market. It's going to create lots of jobs, but it wouldn't happen but for agriculture and agriculture's role. And it's not just aviation fuel. It's not just working for the Defense Department. It's virtually all the chemicals, all the materials, all the fabrics that are produced in this country are now transitioning to a bio-based format. It today is a $364 billion industry, the bio-based products industry. There are literally thousands of products that are being made from plant-based materials, from crop residue, from woody biomass, even from municipal waste converted into fuel and energy, and chemicals, and materials, and fabrics, and fibers. There are four million people employed today in this industry. And we're just 
beginning. So agriculture is helping to lead an effort to redefine, recreate the American economy, to bring back those jobs where we process, where we make, create, and innovate. Those middle class jobs that people talk about all the time. You got them when you're processing, when you're making, when you're manufacturing. And we're now seeing a slow return of those jobs. The unemployment rate in rural America has come down significantly. The poverty rate has been cut in the last two years in rural America more dramatically than in the last 25 years. And part of it is this evolution that's taking place. So it's an extraordinary time. And it's an extraordinary opportunity for agriculture to continue to be marketed to people who are interested in national security, who are interested in the economic security of American families, and who believe that there is a brighter, better, cleaner energy future for the country. It's also about the environment, environmental security. You know, when the president went to Paris to negotiate with 190 different countries a climate change accord designed to begin the process, the slow process of protecting us against a, a changing climate, allowing us to mitigate and adapt to that change in climate and the consequences and try to avoid even more severe consequences. One of the reasons he was able to do that was because of agriculture. Agriculture stepped up in a very significant way. In a speech I gave in Yale several months ago, I identified 10 building blocks that agriculture has committed itself to that will help to reduce emissions connected with agriculture. Now, American agriculture already is pretty good when it comes to emissions. Roughly 9% of our nation's emissions are connected to agriculture. That compares favorably internationally to 14%. But there's still work to be done with soil conservation, better utilization of water, more appropriate uh, maintenance of our forests, renewable energy, using wood as a creative building product. We just launched a very creative opportunity using wood for multi-story buildings. Uh, we put a million dollars as a prize. It was matched by $2 million from the softwood lumber folks. And two projects, one in New York City, one in Portland, Oregon, are going to build multi-story buildings. One's a condominium project, 10 stories. In Portland, it's going to be an office and a residential mixed 12-story building made from wood. The structural materials will be made from wood through cross-laminated timber. It's a way of compressing the lumber in a way that is stronger and more resilient than asphalt, concrete, steel, other building materials. It's even more fire retardant because it chars, it doesn't burn. When cement basically will crumble, steel will melt. It's an amazing new opportunity. Consider just going into one of the major cities of the United States, seeing concrete block, concrete block, steel, steel, and then all of a sudden an incredibly wonderful design of a wood building that just will just capture your imagination. That's the beginning of agriculture and forestry's commitment to a more environmentally sensitive and more secure America. It's just a tremendous opportunity here. And because of our commitment to those 10 building blocks, the president was in a position to articulate America's goal of reducing its emissions by 26 to 28 percent, which led the Chinese and the Indians, who had been reluctant in the past to participate in these discussions and negotiations, to come to the table. <coughs> It's even creating new income opportunities throughout the United States in rural areas. Conservation used to be thought of simply in terms of our NRCS folks going out and working with individual farmers to do what that individual farmer wanted done on his or her land. Today, it's a different day. It's an opportunity now for that farmer to consider a new income source, what we refer to as an ecosystem market. Since you can measure, verify, and quantify conservation results, you can market those results. You can sell those results to an industry or business that is interested in having those results to satisfy a regulatory responsibility or because they have a social responsibility. Chevrolet just recently spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a working ranch in North Dakota to purchase carbon sequestration credits. We have water ecosystem markets. We have habitat ecosystem markets. We have carbon sequestration soil health ecosystem markets. It's a brand new income source, redefining the way we think about agriculture. It's not just about corn and beans. It's about conservation as an income source. In fact, Howard Buffett came to our Outlook Forum conference in February this year and spoke about how he, on his farms, has determined that conservation can actually be a marketable
commodity in crop and that it increases the productivity of his operation. So there is a brand new world here with agriculture leading the way in terms of environmental security. Now that's the reason why we've engaged and participated in the Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance, now over a hundred countries and organizations committed to these practices that will allow us to sequester more carbon, to reduce emissions. It's why we are engaged in the Global Research Alliance with 47 other countries sharing research uh, on crop production, animal production, rice production, nutrient management, so we can be better stewards. It's why we're opening the vaults of agricultural research at USDA to the entire world, uh, no longer just maintaining that research that you all have helped to pay for over the years, now making it available to the rest of the world so that we can build more innovation, more creativity in how we approach agriculture. Environmental security, energy security, economic security, national security, each and every one of these is a selling point for agriculture. Each and every one of these is an innovative, creative, and, and I think inspiring way to say to young people if they want to make a difference, if they want to change their country, if they want to be better stewards, if they want to help the country continue to be the strongest and most powerful nation in the world, agriculture is a place where you can do this. And I want to make two other points before I take questions. And that is, it's also about the freedom that every single one of the people in this audience enjoys. David Jepson grew up. I don't know when he decided he wanted to be a reporter. But he made that decision. And I suspect he probably didn't think a lot about who was going to feed his family. I don't think he thought about whether or not he had any responsibility to make sure that he could grow the food that his family would need. He was thinking about being the best political reporter he could possibly be. When I grew up, I wanted to be a lawyer. I never thought about being a farmer. I never thought about who was going to feed my family. I had the freedom to think and dream as big as I wanted to. And every single American who is not a farmer is able to have that dream, to have that thought process, because they have delegated, either consciously or subconsciously, the responsibility of feeding themselves and their family to the American farmer. It's incredible freedom that we have. It's an amazing set of opportunities. And I don't know the last time we thanked the American farmer for that opportunity, but that's another way of marketing farming as a way of explaining to people how important and significant it is to this country. Now, there are a lot of threats to this world in terms of agriculture. There's the issue of who's going to farm and the aging nature of farmers. There's the issue of who owns the land. As we look at more and more land being rented and owned by non-farm families, there's the issue of climate. There's the issue of sustainability and stewardship. All of these are important issues. And I would encourage our farmers to take a more proactive and not a reactive approach to all of these challenges. I would encourage them to understand and appreciate that people are now more engaged than they have been for quite some time in where their food comes from and how it's grown, and not be concerned or fearful of that, but to embrace it as a way of making the case to the 99.9% .9 of America that doesn't farm, that farming is really important. Give them an opportunity to explain the challenges, the risks, the difficulties, the hard work, the danger that's associated with farming, but also remind them of the role that farming plays in our national security, our economic security, our energy security, and our environmental security. And re recognize and remind them that every single person who chooses another way of life is able to do so because we have delegated that responsibility of feeding our families. Now consider one last point. You know, and this is a really important point to me. Rural America today is 15% of America's population. But nearly 40% of America's military comes from rural America. Why is that? Now, some cynics have suggested the reason that is is because young people are looking for opportunity. They want to get away from or escape the small town. And they see the military as a vehicle and route to do that. I don't think that's the reason. 
You see, I think these young people who grow up in these small towns grow up around a value system that is linked directly to farming. A value system that understands and appreciates, as farmers do, that you can't keep taking from something that's valuable, that provides something to you. You can't keep taking from the land. Every farmer who's in this audience today, I know, understands that they can't keep taking from the land. They have to give something back. They have to replenish it. They have to re-nourish it in order for it to continue to be productive. Kids who grow up with that value system understand that a country that provides this enormous liberty and freedom that we enjoy and sometimes take for granted requires something back. And they look for opportunities. Often it's in military service. Sometimes it's in volunteering and being part of a community. Now, I can't convince every young person who's been born and raised in a small town to stay in a small town or come back to a small town, but I want to make sure they have the opportunity to do that if they choose. And the way to do that is making sure that we have a vibrant economy in rural America, one that provides options, one that supports this great work of American agriculture, one that complements production agriculture with local and regional food systems, with ecosystem markets, with bio-based manufacturing occurring in small communities. One that creates enough value, enough income to support families. So you see, this is an important time. It's an important topic. Uh, and it's one that I feel very passionate about. Because I, uh, as governor, I, I was the, the commander in chief of the National Guard. And during the course of the eight years I was governor, we obviously were engaged in conflict uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I had to basically send those troops from our National Guard units off to a war. I had to go to the ceremonies where they were saying goodbye to their families for long, long periods of time with the risk that some would not come back or those that did would come back not whole. It's very emotional. I was there in the welcoming home ceremonies, one of the most joyous occasions that I've ever experienced in my life, when a father saw a child for the first time, reunited with a loved one, mothers embracing their sons and daughters who had been gone and in harm's way. Forty-one times, though, I had to reach out to family members whose loved ones were lost. By far the hardest thing I had to do as governor. And one of those individuals was a guy by the name of Bruce Smith. Yeah, Bruce had been in the National Guard for over 20 years. Uh, he was a helicopter pilot. He served in Iraq. His job was to ferry people from one neighborhood to another in Baghdad at the time when Baghdad was extraordinarily dangerous. I, I, I know because I went to Baghdad during that period, and we literally couldn't drive from one neighborhood to another for fear of uh, being hit with bombs. Bruce's helicopter one night was hit with a handheld missile. And as it was explained to me, uh, he had a split-second decision to make as that chopper was in trouble, whether he could maneuver it to the extent that he had any maneuverability left to potentially save the people in the back and increase their chances of, of, uh, of living, or whether he would put himself uh, in a position where he could survive and his co-pilot could survive and increase their chances of living. He did what he was trained to do in that small town of West Liberty, where he lived with his family, wife and two children. He put himself at greater risk and his co-pilot at greater risk, and he and his co-pilot died that day. But 17 people walked out of that helicopter crash alive. I had to call Bruce's wife. And as David knows, I've given a lot of speeches. Uh, I've never really found it difficult to find words to express myself, but on that particular occasion, I was troubled and I was having trouble. And I hemmed and hawed, I said about, I said, you know, thoughts and prayers and great sacrifice and honor and all of those words, but I was struggling. This wonderful woman, uh, Aliva Smith, basically interrupts me in mid-sentence and she says, you know, Governor, I've got it figured out. And I thought to myself, this woman just found out 24 hours ago that her husband of over 20 years had died. I think she was part-time employed. She now has the responsibility of raising two kids. I couldn't, couldn't fathom how she could have it, quote, figured out. She said, the way I have it figured, those 17 people who lived that day needed Bruce more in that split second than I'll need him 
the rest of my life. You want to know why I stand up here talking about agriculture in rural America? Because people like that. They're the heart and soul of this country. And they deserve to make sure that people understand what they do for this country. And it's easy to knock and criticize. But there are great people who farm our land. There are great people who live in those small towns, who care deeply about their country, and who make an incredible contribution. And we should be forever thankful for what they do for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to allow the secretary to call on uh, the, the questioners. As we mentioned, there are handheld microphones here. Um, please use a microphone because uh, we're, we're recording this. It, it's necessary for that. And there are uh, people in the audience who uh, have difficulty hearing. So, <laughs> Including the secretary. So. <laughs> um, it's kind of bright in that light, so I, I may not see folks in the back. So, uh, yes, sir, right here. I have the privilege to be married to a Cuban American. Um, can you do the dirty work now? How do we make a connection with that third group who are kicked out of Cuba, who are now all bankers and lawyers and consummate professionals? You know, it's uh, interesting you ask that question uh, uh, about the, the generational challenge of people whose lives were impacted and affected uh, in the 1960s uh, with the Bay of Pigs and other circumstances where, uh, where this, uh, this strained relationship uh, really, really began and how we are able to make um, the case to those folks uh, to begin a different direction in order to obtain the benefits of, of an improved relationship. The president gave a speech yesterday uh, at a refurbished theater in Havana. And I was obviously privileged to be in the audience along with a lot of young Cubans and many of the Cuban uh, government officials. I was surprised that the president actually mentioned the Bay of Pigs. Uh, I was surprised that he uh, talked about that uh, and the circumstances surrounding it, as well as the missile crisis, in pointing out how dangerously close we came, be in part because of a strained relations. And that for 60 years or so, we have tried a way of isolation in an effort to change the minds of Cubans and the Cuban government. And the reality is that all we did during that period, for the most part, was hurt the Cuban people. And so it's his view, and I think it's an instructive one, that we ought to try something different, that we ought to create a bridge, we ought to create a relationship in which the Cubans can see what an alternative looks like. It's going to be their choice what kind of economic system that they have. It's certainly going eventually, I believe, to be their choice in terms of how they are structured and how they're governed. We're not going to be able, nor should we, dictate that. But we can show them a different approach. We can show them the benefits of that different approach. We can help them, if they choose to create a more market-based economy, to do so so that they can get the benefits of that market-based economy. Agriculture, I think, is the simplest way to begin that process. I mean, this is a country that does not have a banking system. This is a country that uh, has relied extensively on support from other countries, direct cash support. It doesn't have what we would probably uh, determine a functioning economy. So we got to start somewhere. And agriculture is universal. It's something that. There's a basic understanding. And there's opportunity here for them to help us and for us to help them. Here's how we help them. 
80, as I said, 80% of their food is imported. They need our rice, they need our poultry, they need our soybeans. We, on the other hand, have this incredibly increased demand for organic food products. And right now, in America, we are not capable of producing all that is necessary to meet a demand that grows at 15% a year. We're going to need help. Otherwise, the cost of that will go to the point where only a handful of people can afford it. And the op option will be not available to consumers. That's not the way we work in America. We like to create this diversity and opportunity for folks. So we can help them with a high-value proposition that meets a demand that we have. We can help them with some basic commodities that will allow them to provide a more sustainable, more uh, predictable, and less expensive uh, uh, imports. All we have to do is remove the barriers that currently exist and make American products not competitive. That's the embargo and some of the credit requirements. Uh, I think things are changing generationally. Uh, and we had this conversation with students earlier. I think in Florida, for example, there's, there's, a, there's a generational shift that's occurring among some of the hardliners who are older and the second and third generation of these, of these families that now have lived in the United States who believe that there's an opportunity to reconnect, who believe that if Cuba were willing to embrace the internet and allow more access to information that there would be a significant demand for a market-based economy. There would be a significant demand for a closer relationship with a country that's 90 miles off their shore, so long as we don't suggest that we have the answer for them, so long as we don't suggest that we're dictating to them what they should do. They're a sovereign nation. They have the right to make their own decisions. But I think the President's right. We tried one way for 60 years. Let's try another way for a few years and see what happens. I'm pretty sure just based on the reaction of the Ag Minister, uh, and, and seeing the opportunity that exists and the, and the need that they have, that we've got something going here that I think we want to continue. And if it continues, I think there'll be a closer relationship. I will tell you that I was in Chile and Peru, and, and uh, th this is a really important point. It's not just about Cuba. It's about Latin America and America's position and place in Latin America. Chile and Peru are strong supporters of the United States. They like the United States. The people of their country like the United States. They are embracing many of, uh, uh, of our values. The Chilean leaders and the Peruvian leaders that I met with to a person unsolicited by me said, we want you to know how important it is that you're doing the right thing in Cuba because it's going to help us help you in international organizations. It's going to help us be a stronger advocate for U.S. position uh, in the Organization of American States or, or those kinds of forums. It's also going to help us in agriculture because we have international forums where we articulate the need for science-based rules, a recognition of biotechnology, for example. Not every country agrees with that. Cuba is actually a pretty good supporter of ours in that context. Well, now we have potentially a stronger voice among smaller countries, a presence, if you will, that's going to help us advance the cause of science. So it's, it's a broader discussion than just one island country. It's our place in Latin America. Uh, it's our role in international forums. It's taking another talking point away from some of the folks who don't agree with us. And I think at the end of the day, the Cuban people are going to benefit. So that's the case I would make. And I think if, if given a chance, I think it'll work. Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. The uh, last farm bill had a difficult time getting through Congress because of the attempt to separate the food stamp portion uh, from the farm uh, agricultural policy portion. Looking forward to the next farm bill, how do you see the dynamic playing out within Congress in terms of those two issues and the success of getting a farm bill passed that will actually deal with the issues on the farm, addressing those issues, as well as the food stamp program or SNAP or whatever particular term you want to use for it, which will address the needs of the urban and working poor. Seems to me there's a, a fairly uh, difficult road to walk there, and I was wondering kind of insights you might have on dealing with that. 
What a great question. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance for a fairly long answer, but it's an important one. First of all, uh, I, I, could, uh, I could be cute and say, well, it kind of depends on the Congress that we have, but I'm not going to be cute. <laughs> um, because it is an important question. I think, first of all, it would be, in my view, a very serious mistake for farm advocates, for production agriculture, to separate the two. And it's just simple math. If you, as agriculture and production agriculture, represent less than 1% of America's population, and the 99% don't necessarily always appreciate what you do for them, and maybe we don't do as good a job as we need to to convince them, then the politics of this make it hard. So you need allies. The farm community needs allies. They need people to support the farm programs while we better educate the rest of the 99% that, in essence, all of America benefits from this, with affordable food, economic opportunity, the, the, the points I made. Now, the farmers have to understand that the food assistance programs actually also help farmers. <laughs> I, and I made this case during the discussions we had about the Farm Bill. I said, you know, and granted, farmers don't get a, as much as I think they ought to out of the food dollar that's spent. Every dollar that's spent, farmers get roughly 15 cents. So every dollar that's spent in the SNAP program, 15% of that ends up in a farmer's pocket, so to speak. It helps to stimulate demand for product, which supports prices, which impacts farm income. It also obviously creates, helps to create jobs. And especially during recessionary times, it helps to stimulate the economy because it gets in the economy very quickly. So it supports people who are working, who in turn can buy more food, that in turn create more demand, that in turn provide more stable, secure prices. So the nutrition programs are helpful in that respect. I would also say it is not just the folks who live in cities who use SNAP. And this is an important point. 85% of the persistently poor counties in this country are rural. The level of child poverty is higher in rural America than it is in urban America. And I, I, I went to the president and pointed this out to him, and he, he, you know, he, he said, well, what, do we, what can we do about this? And so we have a rural council that is dedicated uh, in part to creating more economic opportunity but also in part to look at child poverty in rural areas with a specific focus on strategies that will help alleviate uh, the impacts of poverty. So the food stamp SNAP program <coughs> helps people poor wherever they are. And there are a lot of poor people in parts of this country that need help. So if you're a farmer, you need allies. If you're a food advocate, you need support from rural legislators because not everybody's supportive of these programs, right? Some people want to block ground. I, I mean, I just can't resist this. You're going to allow the state government, they can't get a budget to decide what to do with the... <laughs> Why would you do that? You wouldn't. Uh, and as a former governor, I get the idea of states being the laboratory of democracy. But I also get that the federal government doesn't get the credit it deserves. I, I, I told uh, David, I said, uh, you know, the, the Department of Agriculture, since I've been secretary, has invested $47 billion in the state of Illinois. That's one department, $47 billion. It's home loans, it's business loans, it's farm loans, it's conservation, it's uh, nutrition, it's all that we do. So part of what happens, and part of the reason why we, we've seen unemployment come down, is in part because we're investing in those opportunities in rural areas. So, you know, I'm happy to work with governors, but I know what happens with a block grant. I know that a lot of that money goes to other priorities and doesn't necessarily always get spent the way it was intended to be spent. So I think it's a partnership. And the SNAP program is a partnership. States administer it, we fund it. And I'm proud to say that while I've been secretary, we've increased the, the folks 
who are eligible for SNAP, who, getting SNAP, so now at 85%. And who are these people? This is another interesting point. Who are these people? Now, I think most people think, well, these people on SNAP, these people are kind of gaming the system a little bit, you know? They, you know, they're not working really hard, and they, they're getting this benefit, and they're buying stuff that I can't afford to buy. I hear that a lot. And then I tell people, I say, well, you know, here's who, who 80% of the people receiving SNAP are senior citizens, children, people with severe disabilities, or people who are actually in the workforce who are working a minimum wage job or part-time job. So then I say, which of those four groups do you not want to help? They say, well, no, we, we, you know, we, we, they're, they're okay. What about the other 20%? Those are able-bodied people without dependents. Here's what you don't know about those people. They are required to either be working or getting education and training for, I think it's 30 hours uh, a week, or they are limited in the benefits that they get to three months of benefits every three years. Most people don't know that. Now, during the recession, many states waived that requirement, understandably, because there weren't jobs. But now, as the economy is improving, states are beginning to reinforce those rules. So there are safeguards in that system. And then it's, well, you know, there's a lot of fraud in that program, a lot of fraud. The fraud and, and error rate is less than five. The, er, the fraud rate's a little over 1%. The, the error rate's 3.5%, some of the lowest in the, st in, in the federal government, or state government, for that matter. And then it's, well, you know, those people buy a lot of stuff that I can't buy. And we've done an analysis of that, and the reality is SNAP folks aren't buying any, really, their, their purchasing patterns aren't any different than anybody else's. So it's an education process. And I think if you separate them, then you may end up still having nutrition programs because of the fact that it serves 46 million people and there's a large constituency support of that. And farmers may end up losing allies and not being able to get the necessary risk management tools and support structures and systems that allow them to stay in business during tough times so they can continue to afford, give us affordable food, safe food, great abundance, trade, jobs, national security, economic security, et cetera. So I, it, it would be a mistake. And, but I think, the, and this will be the last thing I'll say about this, I think that the, that the message for farmers, in my view, is we have got to be a lot more proactive in terms of responding to concerns that people raise. Because we've got a good story to tell. And we may have to make some adjustments in what we do and how we do it. But, but the more defensive we are about issues, the harder it is to get that coalition to get the farm bill passed. And if you don't have a farm bill, you go back to permanent law, and when you go back to permanent law, you're going to see dramatically increased food prices in this country, which nobody's going to like. Oh, no, you can't be telling me it's time. No, seriously. Really? That's I, it? I promised these big, burly guys that work with you that I would have you <laughs> on, headed out the door here See, by I don't think Chad's burly. <laughs> he's not talking about you. He's talking about Malcolm. Uh, One more question. Uh, student right here. Right here, right here. I, actually, too, I, I, if, there's a, if there's a question from a woman, I'll be happy to sort of gender balance here. I was wondering, um, what do you perceive to be the uh, technologies most important technologies you would like to see from agricultural research in the coming decade or so? Wow. <laughs> well, global population projected to go to 9 billion plus in your lifetime, for sure. Hopefully in my lifetime. That's maybe a little shaky. In order to meet the food needs of that ever-increasing population, you're going to have to increase current production by 70% globally. That's not going to be easy. Uh, given the state of agriculture in so many different countries at so many different stages. So, and, and you have to do that in the context of weather patterns and, and climate change that it's going to make it harder in many parts of the world to do what we've always done. So we're going to have to have innovation that allows us to increase productivity, but to be able to do it with less reliance on chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, 
less water, uh, warmer temperatures. So there's going to have to be a lot of work to figure out how to do that. Now, there are folks focusing on photosynthesis in terms of trying to figure out how to, how to really maximize that in terms of crop production. And then you have the, 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 the corresponding need on the animal side. Overlaying all that are new pests and diseases because you're in a global economy. Golly, you know, things just travel all over the place now these days. You know, a wild duck comes from Asia, and the next thing I know, I'm spending $800 million on avian influenza in Iowa and Minnesota. So, and, and the reason I did is because the ducks and the geese stayed in Iowa and Minnesota. So I never thought of Iowa and Minnesota being a place, you know, where you'd have an extended vacation. You know, it's nice. <laughs> it's, it, it's a great place to live, right? But these, these ducks, and they stayed there because the, the, the weather was changing because of climate, and, and it, was a, it was a more unpredictable winter, so they, they stayed. So they had a congregation of this virus, which caused problems. So you have to have that research to deal with that, right? So that's on the one side. On the other side, you've got this issue of nutrition and the challenges we have as a nation in terms of our obesity rates, in terms of trying to figure out how we transition from a sick care system to a well, wellness system and the choices we make as consumers and what we eat. And will we get to a day where instead of taking a pill for some arthritic condition that you might have, you'll, you'll eat a certain fruit or vegetable that will be better for you? We need, we need to know all about that. And on top of that, uh, land mass that's available for farming as population increases, these people got to live someplace. So how are you going to be able to do it with less land? Do we get into vertical infrastructure, vertical farming inside buildings? How do people feel about that? And do we ultimately evolve, as some people would like us to, to a day where you're not even using an animal to produce milk? You're replicating the biological function of a cow eating grass, turning it into milk in a laboratory and producing milk that way. It's a brave new world. And America needs to be leading that effort, in my view, which puts a great onus on people like you um, and others to be the scientists of the future and to give us an, a better understanding of science so that we don't have what I think is a crazy war on science on both, both sides of the political uh, equation. We got folks over. Uh, on the right who say, what climate change? We got folks on the left that go, you know, GMOs are going to kill you. You know, neither one of those positions is supported by the science, in my view. Neither one, right? So we, we have to get a better appreciation and understanding of, of, of the role of science if we're going to have science play the role it needs to play. So I would say that's just a huge challenge. But there are, you know, there are just so many other opportunities there. Uh, the bio-based economy, I think there are just tremendous opportunities there as well. One more question from a young lady, if there is one. There. Yep, there we go. Once again, I just want to thank you for giving your presentation and your time to us. Um, you touched briefly on wanting to bridge the gap in agriculture for this season. And as a young producer and an ag education major, and a person that's been there multiple times and seen firsthand what they have to work with in the agriculture industry, I'm curious to see what your programs are to help educate these students on modern technology. E educate, I'm sorry. Educate the students on oh. modern technology. Well, um, we're somewhat hampered by, by the fact that we can't use any tax-supported programs because of the law, the, our uh, domestic law, the embargo. It prevents USDA from doing that. So between now and the time the embargo is lifted, whenever that occurs, the ability to reach out to the Cubans is going to be based on what are called uh, checkoff dollars, uh, you may be familiar with what they are, but some people may not be. When a bushel of soybeans is sold or corn or whatever, producers self-assess themselves, put money into a pot, and that money is then used for research and promotion. As part of the Cuban trip, I authorized the use of those dollars 
for the first time to be used for research and education to begin the process of better understanding the Cuban market and the Cuban preferences. And also, we've asked the, the, the Congress to give us money to have people physically in Cuba, people that work for USDA, so that we can better understand the pests and diseases and challenges that they have, so we can begin the thought process of well, what exactly do they need, how would it work, you know, what, what universities would play a role. We don't have any of that information because we've been literally locking ourselves out of that for 60 years. So we have a lot of catch up to do. Um, and so, until we, until we have the embargo lifted, we have to work through that chuck-off program. We have to work through individual commodity groups and organizations. And my hope is that, with the reaction to the President's visit, that there is a growing demand on the part of agriculture and business and people that see the benefit of this to overcome the political opposition, get that embargo lifted so we can actually really set up a more aggressive effort uh, at, at identifying uh, strategies. I'll learn a lot more as well about the impact of climate on the Caribbean when I go to Puerto Rico, and hopefully Minister Rodriguez will accompany me at our, at our sub -hub, uh, climate sub-hub, which is assessing the vulnerabilities of, Q uh, of Caribbean agriculture so that we'll know better generally what we're faced with in terms of the climate change, um, how we're going to adapt and mitigate, you know, wh what should we do to make sure that we can continue to grow and raise product in the Caribbean. That will also help to drive. And then finally, working with the organic industry in particular, they're going down, uh, leaders in that organization are going down in the next couple of weeks, I think, to begin the process of, of identifying how Cuba might be able to be a supplier and they, of course, will have certain specifications and requirements, uh, which they will obviously inform the Cubans on. So there's, there's a whole lot of work to be done. There's the, the setting up a credit program. I mean, these farmers don't have any credit. How do they buy machinery? How do they buy seed? How's that going to work? Uh, they, don't have, they have private ownership of land, but it's very limited. It's in a cooperative form. How's that going to work? Uh, who owns the land? Who's going to rent it? What's the legal structure for that? I mean, there's just a lot of work to be done because of 60 years of not doing anything. Uh, and, and lesson learned there for us, I think, that that, that engagement at the end of the day, um, I think, is, is ultimately going to be more successful than isolation. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is a great speech. As I do with all our guests, I want to present you with a copy of Paul, the essential Paul Simon, which is Dr. Jackson's uh, anthology of, uh, of Paul Simon's writings. We call it Paul Simon's Greatest Hits. Great. Uh, all the problems Paul wrote about, what you do is you read these columns and just add a few zeros on the end. And, you could read that they'd be appropriate today. You know, David, thank you. There's a wonderful picture of uh, Senator Simon in the room that David uh, gave me to, to do some phone calls today. He's the only guy I know that could be standing on a dock uh, overlooking a lake in a button-down white shirt <laughs> with pencils in his pocket and look totally natural. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you.